My last video touched on the prevalence of bias and ignorance consuming Twitter, as well as the distinction between good and bad Pokemon animation. This video will shed a light on the more nefarious nature of Twitter, while also breaking down discussions between people and to demonstrate how conflict can reach a breaking point. In doing so, I also get an opportunity to explain, in great detail, the function, purpose, and strategy behind Pokemon animation in a 3D turn-based style game. It starts off with a tale of deceit. I made a tweet that expresses my right to mute people. For those unfamiliar with Twitter, you can mute users which means they can still see your posts and respond to them, but their posts will be hidden from you, giving you the option to toggle them on or off. You can also block users on Twitter, which completely blocks any and all interactions. I personally don't utilize this feature, however, as it seems a bit excessive. This tweet has been screen capped and taken out of context so many times in the attempt to drive a malicious, false narrative about me that I have lost a little faith in humanity. I first saw this tweet screen capped and taken out of context by JMA's The Bulbasaur. Jay, opposed to being muted by me, had this to say. I know you muted me, but this is awareness. At Disney Kingdom, you are egotistical, obstinate, and worst of all, you continue to be a tumor in the Pokemon community. Honestly, muting criticism has lowered any respect I had left for you. So, Jay is pushing the false narrative that I mute criticism, preceding that statement by equating me to a tumor, vindicating why he muted in the first place. He then includes a screen cap of my tweet with no context, stating that I mute people with no indication other than his word of what I mute or why, hence the false narrative. I responded to this deliberate and malicious character assassination attempt in time. Clown emojis, downplaying mine and others' opinions, and vulgar hashtags is not criticism. It's borderline harassment. I value, respect, and invite actual criticism and slash or discussion. I mute the intellectually blind to avoid running in futile circles. I don't mute criticism. I mute irrational, disrespectful, insufferable individuals who don't care or respect my own personal opinions. I never block anyone because I'm always open to constructive criticism and discussion. I'm not open to those who don't wish to discuss or to those who wish to demean either myself or others. Another individual I have muted, named Paka, also weighed in on my tweet. He included an actual link to the thread of the tweet, which makes him more honest than his fellow colleagues, but he apparently didn't even take the time to read the thread. His false narrative was that I mute opposing opinions, ending off with hashtag distant king dumb. That's clever, I'll admit, but that just reinforces the justification and decision behind muting them in the first place. I don't mute people who have differing opinions. Some of the best discussions I've ever had, most of which took place outside of Twitter because Twitter is a cesspool of negativity that is further exacerbated by its character, was with people that had completely different opinions from my own. You could have a negative opinion about me as a person, that's fine, you don't have to like me. But if you feel it's appropriate to express your distaste of my being through reprehensible and downright embarrassing behavior, then I have the right to silence it at my discretion. One final individual that I will expose for attempting to paint a false narrative at my expense is Manga Common, whom I don't have muted. I watched his Twitch critique video and he seemed like a pretty reasonable guy, so I have no clue why he went out of his way to make a tweet about someone he doesn't know, especially considering that we've never spoken to one another, ever. He said, you know, closing your ears off is just as bad as being blind. Oh, and this comes off as egotistical. I see the truth, guys. Yeah, sure, pal. Keep peddling that. We got some real classy stuff right here. You can't teach the blind to see is a metaphor not meant to be taken literally. It's not referring to the truth, it's referring to point of view and perspective. You can't teach the metaphorically blind to see your perspective, which I will demonstrate very shortly. There's nothing egotistical about this sentiment. I called out his deliberate mischaracterization. Wow, dude, you seriously need to actually look into things before spreading your nonsense. Had you even read the thread I posted that on, you would immediately understand what I'm talking about. Sad. He apologized, except not really, by admitting that he was wrong. He also admitted to consciously omitting the context of my words simply because it was too much effort for him to find, and it wouldn't have helped in building his false narrative anyway, so he didn't care to find it. He also tried to play the victim in this scenario, despite the fact that he attempted to slander me with his aspersions stating that I wasn't talking to him like a person because I labeled his intentionally uninformed and malicious fiction of me as sad. Let's dive into the context surrounding my tweet and the real reason for why I said what I did. It starts off with Marty, aka Joe's girlfriend, with her tweet claiming the Reeves 3DS asset is just a figment of imagination and therefore everyone should apologize to Game Freak. 
I asserted that people aren't assuming the assets are being reused because there is an overwhelming amount of video evidence that supports the reusal narrative. I also reaffirm that the reuse of assets isn't an issue, just that some animations, like the textures of the models, need tweaks. Ending with that sentiment seems reasonable, considering the fact that Pokemon are being removed from the game for that very reason. We will be focusing on a conversation between two individuals. The first is named James Card, whom I have muted. The second is Shy Guy Mask. Even though I couldn't see Card's messages, I could easily follow the conversation through Shy Guy's reaction. It eventually got to a point where Shy Guy was visibly frustrated and bewildered, a state I know all too well. That's when I stepped in to alleviate his suffering. Let's follow, together, the train of thought and logic behind these series of exchanges that led to this conclusion. After my comment on Marty's tweet, another guy I have muted, who completely missed the point of my tweet, proceeds to go off with the usual veteran. This is where Shy Guy enters, responding to him. Shy Guy ended off with saying, The vast majority of battle animations in Sword and Shield don't hold a candle to an N64 Pokemon game, or even rival Digimon. This is true. Here, Shy Guy is referring to animation quality, as I touched on earlier. James Card finally joins in, stating, The N64 Pokemon game reuses animations more than even the current game do. Flareon uses the same tail shaking animation for its entry animation, idle, and special attack mode. He then includes Surf as an example, which makes no sense because Flareon can't learn Surf. Card has shifted the argument from animation quality to the application of animation. This is the case, by the way, for all 3D Pokemon games, which Shy Guy clarifies while returning back to the topic of the discussion, which is animation quality. 3D Pokemon having general animations to be reused for most moves is not new. This is true, and it's exactly how the game animates for 3D Pokemon. There are three attack categories in Pokemon. Physical attacks, special attacks, and status attacks. Each Pokemon typically has two to three general attack animations that correspond to each of the three attack categories respectively. This is why Game Freak doesn't need to make thousands of unique animations for each attack for each Pokemon. Let's use Game Freak's Charizard as an example. Game Freak's Charizard has three attack animations. These three animations are used for animating all 65 different attacks Charizard learns. The first animation is used primarily for special attacks, but it can also be used for status attacks. Charizard's second animation is used for any punching, swiping, or claw attack. Charizard's third animation is used for everything else. As practical as this animation strategy is, it has some limitations, especially with regards to physical attacks. A punch looks completely different from a kick, for example. This can be detrimental to cohesion between Pokemon's attack and their animation. Cohesion is important because greater cohesion translates to more convincing animation, which leads to enhanced expression, resulting in greater satisfaction when using an attack, which means that the game is more fun and enjoyable. Many special attacks can also achieve simple cohesion through the use of anchor points which can be used to properly position and align certain Pokemon special attacks to the most appropriate point on the Pokemon model. You can think of it as an attacking point where the attack emanates from. Blastoise is a prime example to demonstrate this. Blastoise has two cannons on his back. The sole purpose of these cannons is to shoot water out of them. This can be achieved by anchoring two water beams close to Blastoise's cannons respectively. This creates the illusion that water is coming from his cannon. Blastoise is an iconic Pokemon, thanks in part to his cannons. He is seen in all Pokemon mediums using his cannons to shoot water, except in Game Freak games. Game Freak has a hard time positioning their special attacks in general to elicit cohesion, which can be seen in Max Flare for several Pokemon. The beam is anchored to a fixed location instead of originating from the Pokemon, which shatters the illusion of the Pokemon using the attack. Shy Guy addresses the solution to the limitation of Game Freak's animation system while still remaining on topic. The difference is that Stadium had more general animations and better general animations. Shy Guy included a video that supports what he is saying, which showcases unique kicking animations for some Pokemon in Pokemon Stadium. This helps in solidifying cohesion whenever a Pokemon uses a kicking attack. The greater number of animations means the greater level of expression. Expression is enhanced even further if the animations themselves are high quality. Let's use Genius Sonority Charizard from TBR as an example. Remember how Game Freak Charizard only has 3 animations for 60 plus attacks? TBR Charizard has 7 unique attack animations for when Charizard uses a move. His first animation is used typically for special attacks and status attacks. His second animation is used for punching, swiping, or claw attacks. His third animation is used for kicking attacks. His fourth animation is used for charging style attacks. His fifth animation is becoming airborne by flying. His sixth animation is diving down from the flying position. And his seventh animation is a running animation to approach opposing Pokemon. 
TBR's Charizard has more than double the general attack animation compared to Game Freak Charizard. This is just one of the many reasons why the Pokemon in TBR's battling system are more expressive than their Game Freak counterparts. Shy Guy ended with, Let me know when you find anything on par in Sword and Shield. Card responds with a single animation. Shy Guy provided a 5 minute video to support his case. Card provided an 8 second clip of a single animation of a single Pokemon. This is what we refer to as cherry picking, which is a term many people love to see. The animation shown by Card is one of the better ones in terms of cohesion, convincingness, and satisfaction. Score Bunny is using one of about 3 general attack animations here. This would have been a great animation to use for Double Team, instead of the non animated version of Game Freak Shy Guy contends that Flame Charge specifically will not have comparable quality when used by other Pokemon. This is typically why larger sample sizes are more beneficial to both parties in a discussion. In Card's defense, there is literally only that one example of Flame Charge, other than our canine's game diversion due to the Dynamax phenomenon. Card responds it's not a signature move, which means all other Pokemon will have comparable quality when using the move. This makes no sense because the move the Pokemon uses doesn't dictate the animation. Regardless if it's a signature attack or not, all Pokemon use a set of general attack animations as highlighted earlier. I believe Card, at this point, still doesn't grasp this concept. Shy Guy wants a more clear explanation, stating Mega Kick also isn't a signature move. Card responds, No it isn't. However, I do not believe Game Freak has ever made a specific animation for a general move for a specific Pokemon. Right here, Card is proving Shy Guy's point that Stadium has more attack animations to procure greater cohesion. He continues, so yes, it can be informed that any Pokemon who learns this move does a similar animation. This statement made by Card confirms that he doesn't understand the core fundamental root of the argument. He believes that a Pokemon move dictates the Pokemon animation when it's literally the inverse of that. This misunderstanding can be attributed to his lack of knowledge regarding the animation system in Pokemon. Shy Guy, recognizing Card's misunderstanding, once again reiterates that all Pokemon have predetermined general attack animations highlighting the lack of quality regarding physical attack specifically. He then includes a video showcasing two cannons flying type z -Man. I'm not entirely sure why he chose this example, maybe to highlight the poor quality of physical attack animations, but this only further confuses Card, which means everything goes downhill from this point forward as the circle closes in on itself. Card, in his confusion, says, I'm sorry, is that Sword and Shield? Sword and Shield reuses all attack animations from the 3DS including Sun and Moon, my guy. The initial argument has now been derailed and has been shifted from animation quality to animation reuse. Keep in mind that Shy Guy explicitly stated attack animations. This is integral to the impending disastrous conclusion. Card simply responds with, not all, which he supports with zero evidence. His word alone is evidence enough. Card claims not all attack animations are reused. This statement is impossible to support because there is no evidence to support it. Shy Guy Mask challenges Card about his statement. I would genuinely like to see an example of an old Pokemon using an all new general animation during battle regarding physical slash special attacks. Do you have any? Shy Guy is very specific with his words here because he's seeking a very specific response, one that Card simply cannot provide. The first criteria that Shy Guy lays out for Card is that the animation must be new and not an improved version of an old animation. Second, the animation must be a general attack animation. This is the second time in a row that Shy Guy has specifically referred to general attack animation. This has also been the core of the entire discussion which we've established that Card either doesn't understand or chooses not to understand. Card fails to meet the criteria established by Shy Guy. He links a video that showcases small changes to existing animations that are also not the aforementioned general attack animations, failing both criteria simultaneously. The other animations featured in the video are the new Dynamax intro animation, which satisfies the new animation criteria, but they clearly are not attack animations as specified throughout this entire thread. Shy Guy, for the third time in a row now, has to repeat himself. I said, an all new general physical slash special attack animation. Maybe reading my post will help. We have now reached the climax of this thread. Shy Guy has repeated himself three times in a row stating the exact same thing, while calling out Card's either intentional or misunderstood misdirection. Card is now back into a corner with no way to defend his position. Any reasonable person would concede by forfeiting their argument and be on their way. There is one strategy remaining, however. It's used by the truly desperate that refuse to yield. Instead of attacking the argument, they turn their attention towards the person they're arguing with and attack them instead. This is a fallacious argumentative strategy reserved for those who can't defend their position in genuine discussions, called an ad hominem. Oh, I get it. You're just angry the game has gotten better animation, just not the animation you want. 
Card has now completely disregarded the entire discussion and is attacking Shy Guy due to his own inability to comprehend the reason behind the discussion in the first place. The circle is now complete. Card either can't see what Shy Guy is talking about or he refuses to see. Shy Guy, now visibly flustered and frustrated, responds, What the hell are you talking about? We're talking about battle animals. Why are you trying to change the subject? Card is trying to change the subject because he can no longer contribute to the one currently being discussed. I've fallen victim to this petty nonsense more times than I can count. A formal, civil discussion is supposed to be like a straight line, with a discernible beginning, middle, and end. In the beginning, both people with opposing opinions share their thoughts. By the middle, each person now knows what the other thinks and why. In the end, you can either agree or agree to disagree, but you usually walk away with learning something either about yourself or about something you didn't realize before. This isn't how discussions go at all, with what I refer to as the circles. The discussion I showed you with Card is a prime example of a circular discussion. It's like throwing your words into a void. They just get lost in translation. You try and interpret what the void spits back at you, but most of the time it's contradictory or unintelligible. You end up chasing the circles until you trap them in the corner. That's when they resort to their ad hominems and the cycle repeats itself, endlessly. Neither party receives any benefits from the discussion, and everyone's time is wasted endlessly. Seeing Shy Guy go down this bottomless pit, I intervened. I told him he would just be wasting his time running in circles. Shy Guy took solace in my words and recognized that maybe he should just not bother. And that's when I dropped my infamous speech. It's not because of criticism, like some people want you to believe. It's not due to differing opinions, as others have purported. It's not because I'm egotistical and have some sort of god complex, according to a few. I simply wish to avoid circles and to not subject myself to the noise of those who inappropriately express their distaste towards my being unsolicited. I hope you guys were able to follow along. Even a seemingly mundane, fruitless conversation can disguise underlying complexities that are not immediately apparent. With all that being said, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for watching, guys.
Hi hey guys, this video will contain spoilers. Pokemon Sword and Shield. Let's start off with the good, the gym challenge. Everything to do with the gym challenge was actually incredible. At some points during the gym challenge, I got really excited and actually nervous to go into the finals. They've never done gyms as well as they have in Pokemon Sword and Shield. It's a true spectacle once you get into the stadium and it feels like a real sport of the Galar region. A lot of human characters have some awesome animations and are really expressive. For example, I believe his name is Raihan or Ryan? Rai, I guess? The 8th gym leader, uh, well, we'll call him Rai. He has this animation right before he dynamaxes his Pokemon, right before he throws the ball, his Rotom phone comes out and snaps a selfie before he throws it. So it's little things like that that bring characters to life and give them a personality. And a lot of gym leaders are like this. You don't really learn much about them through the story, you learn more about them through their actions and their animation. And that's something that I really appreciate. I wish the gym leaders had a more prominent role in the story so you could learn more about them, but each of them does have a distinct personality that you can see through their animation. Some locations also look really good. Balan Lee, the mushroom forest area, actually looks like a Switch game. There was so much attention that went into that location. The graphical quality spikes in some of these areas and you can see that they really put attention and detail in some of these areas. It kind of blows my mind that you have a location like Balan Lee and the wild area in the same game. When you're in those two locations, they feel like you're in a completely different game. Some Pokemon designs also look really good. For example, Toxtricity is my all-time favorite Pokemon. They added some quality of life improvements like the portable PC from Let's Go, the tutorial skips in the beginning, and not holding the B button to run, it makes the gameplay feel more fluent. And yes, some Pokemon themselves also have high quality animations. A great example of this is Pyro Ball for Cinderace. And again, it's, it's like night and day. You have Pyro Ball, one of the better animations that I've seen in a Pokemon game, and then you have Double Kick, which isn't even animated. So I kind of feel like if they gutted all of the old stuff from the old 3DS games and just went with all new things, the game might have been better overall for that. Now let's get into the bad. So there's no plot. There's no story, really, of any kind. Most of the story happens off screen. For example, you'll hear a loud sound in the background, and you know, it sounds exciting, right? You want to go investigate it. But then, out of nowhere, Leon hops off of his Charizard and basically says, for you to continue doing your little kitty gym challenge while he goes and handles the big boy stuff. And this happens more than once. So while the gym challenge aspect of the game is really well done, that's all the game is, that's all you do, you just do the gym challenge. That is the main story, and the actual main plot is more like a subplot, and it never really happens until the very end. Your character is not really a part of the main story. Leon and Sonya have a better adventure than you do. You also never really touch on the lore of the game, you don't really truly learn what Dynamax is, and the only lore that you get exposed to really from the story is when the wall breaks down and you see the statues. That moment is the most amount of story you experience basically in the entire game until the very end. Rose is arguably one of the worst villains in modern media history. He is that bad. His motivations are questionable at best. He starts off as a really kind of interesting, goofy, smart individual who runs a business and he does a lot to help Galar, and then he randomly devolves into a generic, idiotic villain and you don't understand his motivations, you don't understand where he's coming from. He wants to save the world a thousand years ahead of time by using energy or something. Like, I, I didn't even fully understand his motivations. Even Leon in the story was like, bro, you're crazy, you don't need to worry about this right now, we'll deal with this later, let me do my thing. And then Rose is like, no, I'm gonna deal with this right now. And then Eternatus, I don't know what's up with Eternatus. They don't explain where he came from. Is he an Ultra Beast? Is he just a regular Pokemon? When you fight Rose, there's a broken egg in the background. Was an Eternatus in an egg? Why is he in an egg? Where did he come from? How did Rose know to use Eternatus? How did he know that Eternatus brings the dark days? None of this is explained. It just happens and then you just need to deal with it. And then that's it. And then the game ends. So this is what I was talking about with no story. It's just 
you do the gym challenge for the entire game and then you beat Eternatus and that's the game. There's no exploration. Most of the game is extremely linear, just a bunch of straight lines, a bunch of corridors. This is circumvented slightly with ladders to add a layer of verticality. But the ladders themselves actually kill emerging. Whenever you go on a ladder, it just stops the world from moving. Typically what role-playing games want to do is they want to immerse you into the world. But around every corner, Pokemon Story and Shield is doing its best to shatter that immersion. They give you an escape rope as a key item, which is a nice addition, but you never really need to use it. There are no typical dungeons. The entire game is just a straight line. I never needed to use the escape rope. And the post-game is bone dry. It's as dry as it was in X and Y, there's a battle tower, but the battle tower itself has been gutted. The battle tower is probably the worst it's ever been in the past couple of years. They only have double battles and single battles. And that's literally it. There's no multi-battles. The fetch side quest is just glorified raid battles, but that's something you could do in the wild area before you even get to the first gym. It's nothing new. You don't learn anything. You don't learn anything new about the game. You chase around the royal family, but are they actually royalty or were they just goofs? It's not really as clear cut as I would have liked it to be. And then we'll get into the wild area. Now, the wild area is what shows all of, of the true flaws of the game. It just has signs of being rushed everywhere. The graphical quality dips hard in the wild area. It looks terrible from the textures, the true textures. It, it looks not like a Switch game at all. You have the terrible pop in all over the place. Pokemon just appear out of nowhere and in very close proximity to the player, which shatters immersion. There's nothing really to do in the wild area, it's just a giant open area. You have the raid battles. I'm not a personal fan of raid battles, I didn't even touch them in my entire playthrough. And for the most part, I try to avoid the wild area because it is one of the worst parts about Sword and Shield. It feels like a last minute addition. Everything else in Sword and Shield looks infinitely better than anything you find in the wild area. In conclusion, I had fun, but in order to have fun, I had to enforce arbitrary restrictions. And even then, Sword and Shield was going out of its way for me to not have fun by making the game easier than it should be. For example, with the constant heal, you get healed around every corner. It's a good 3DS game, the best looking 3DS game I've ever seen. It's an okay Pokemon game. It's very comparable to X and Y. It looks graphically better than X and Y, but X and Y has a better story and more content. So, yeah. However, it's a bad game overall. It's not worth its price tag in the slightest. The level of quality and polish is seriously lacking. If you can find the game on sale for the price of a 3DS game, then I say go for it. But other than that, it's not worth the time or the price. And yeah, those are my initial thoughts on the game. I will be working on a proper review coming up that will go into much more detail about everything that's both good and bad about the game. So stay tuned and look forward to that. With that being said, I'll see you guys next time and thanks for watching. Gym leader, uh, we'll, we'll call him Rai. He has this anime. Welcome to 2020! I had a bunch of IRL stuff to take care of, which is why it's been a while. I also have a bit of a cold, unfortunately, so apologies if I sound a bit off. Let's get to it. There was a Pokemon Direct recently that unveiled Game Freak's future plan. Instead of the cliched third version, they will pursue the DLC, which will feature two expansions, Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra, both of which take place in new wild area type locations. I will get into the issues surrounding this momentarily, but first I want to share my thoughts from the direct. Overall, it was surprisingly good. They did share a lot of new information and there is a significant amount of new content being added. New hairstyles with new colors, which is cool. New clothing options, like the Getsis patch, which I already have access to a year in advance. Shout out to the awesome Pokemon modding community. New bike outfit that is significantly more appealing than the default clown suit. I would still prefer a toggle to remove it if desired. New bike skins, cool. Not as cool as a car though. Still not a fan of Dyna slash Gigantamax, but there's new forms like Blastoise, who has acquired several brand new cannons and will use none of them. New Galar forms, like Galarian Articuno. Concept art shows it shooting lasers out of its eyes. I'm positive it will shoot from everywhere but its eyes. New Pokemon that look 
pretty mad to me overall. New Celebi looks especially awful. New co-op play mode looks traversing a Pokemon deck. Hopefully it's not as disgustingly laggy as the wild deck. New tutors with new attacks, which is always exciting and helps to change up the meta. New items like the experience charm that seems to boost the mandatory experience share to help mitigate some grind in order to hyper train your Pokemon more easily. And finally, they will be adding an additional 200 Pokemon from past titles bringing the total number up to a respectable 600 plus. As you can see, there's a lot to add in, and basically all of it is really good stuff. What's great about DLC is that it extricates you from having to suffer through Sword and Shield for a second time, since you can continue with the same save file, which is honestly a blessing in disguise. I'm currently attempting to complete a second run on a different Switch, and it's agonizing. The game has non-existent replayability, and the only motivation I have to complete the second playthrough is when I'm watching a movie so that I can stand with the A button while doing something much more productive. The DLC route is also cheaper than the alternative, which would have been a reskin of the same game for full price. The Sword and Shield expansion pass is half the price of a full game, coming in at $30 USD. Now let's get into some of the criticisms and concerns surrounding this news. The main issue people have with the DLC is that you have to pay more money, 90 USD total, for a proper Pokemon experience, when all of this stuff should have been in the base game from the very beginning. Sword and Shield is severely lacking in content. The game is bone dry, even more so than X and Y, which are considered to be very weak additions to the series content wise. People feel that game could withheld content and are now selling it back to them. For example, it was revealed that Liam has a mentor named Mustard, who is a central character in the upcoming Isle of Armor expansion. Leon is the undefeatable champion. Don't you think Mustard may have been instrumental in Leon being able to achieve such a title? I don't believe Mustard is seen or heard from at all in the main game. Despite being a seemingly vital character in Leon's development on his journey, becoming not only the best trainer in Galar, but a trainer he doesn't need. Having Mustard introduce Leon and elaborate on their relationship would have been a far more meaningful introduction to Leon as opposed to just meeting Leon at a station outside your house. DLC is typically used to complement a game by expanding upon what has already been established. Sword and Shield's DLC is being used to complete the barren base game, bumping up the cost from 60 to 90, which is significant and is a reason why people are taking issue. Sword and Shield are now the most expensive Pokemon titles in existence, costing more than double any past title, and it still doesn't even have all of the Pokemon. The cost is not proportionate to the content you receive. The DLC should have been free. Maybe then Sword and Shield would be recognized as competent and acceptable Pokemon Switch titles. There's another issue with regards to the additional 200 plus Pokemon that are returning in this expansion. Game Freaks are putting out a free update to base Sword and Shield titles, which allows the 200 Pokemon to be compatible but these Pokemon will still be unobtainable in-game, despite it being very easy to create spawn points for the additional Pokemon. However, that would incentivize people to not buy the DLC, therefore hurting Game Freak's bottom line. This means that the only way to get the Pokemon without resorting to purchasing DLC is to A. Trade someone who has the DLC themselves or have transferred them by paying for home. This would be trivial by the way if the GTS wasn't arbitrarily removed. Maybe they will sell it back to us in future DLC. And B, pay for home and transfer them yourself. Yes, the 200 plus mods are technically free to get into a non-DLC title, but you have to go out of your way, scouring public forums until you find what you're looking for. Again, DTS, something that has been a useful staple of the series since Gen 4 on the DS over 12 years ago would have simplified this process, but I guess the Switch is just incapable, somehow. Other than that, the only way to access the Pokemon is through the paywalls being the DLC and or Pokemon Home. Now is a great opportunity to address another issue that people have with regards to both Pokemon Bank and Pokemon Home. Pokemon Bank is, quite frankly, a scam. Each Pokemon is about 260 bytes, and you can store up to 3,000 Pokemon for a whopping 780 kilobytes for $5 annually. That's not even a single megabyte, which is only 1 1,000th of a gigabyte. To put this into perspective, Google Drive gives you 15 gigabytes for free. 15 gigabytes is the equivalent of 15 billion bytes, which makes up approximately 57 million Pokemon. The cost for this using the bank scam system is over 96,000 USD annually. Nintendo makes $96,000 off of storage 
that Google Drive gives away for free per person. But it's only $5. It's not that expensive. You're just cheap. Yeah, well, if I shit on a plate and I sell it to you for $5, it's only $5, but you're still being scammed regardless. The only way to get your bros from the 3DS to your Switch is to buy into a scam. The cloud-based system of Pokemon Bank is seriously unnecessary. They could have just made an application where you could write all of your Pokemon to the SD card, it wouldn't take up even a single megabyte, and then connect the 3DS to the Switch wirelessly using some kind of infrastructure, like home, to move your Pokemon. This is how Game Freak did transfers in the past. From Gen 3 to 4, you needed to utilize Pal Park, which required you to have a Gen 3 game in the bottom of the DS and a Gen 4 cart in the top. This did not require a cloud service and was free of charge. You could also connect the DS to the Wii and send your Pokemon over to either Pokemon Battle Revolution or Pokemon Ranch for free. I see no reason why the 3DS couldn't do the same with the Switch. For Gen 4 to 5, you could utilize the Transfer Lab, but this required two Nintendo DS systems. Now let's talk about Pokemon Home. It comes out next month, but there honestly isn't much we know about it, which is pretty concerning. What we do know is a paid cloud-based service similar to Bank. No price has been announced, but I'm sure it will be anywhere from 5 to 10 USD annually. Home is compatible with the 3DS games, Pokemon Go on mobile, and the Switch games. Transferring Pokemon is one way only, except for Sword and Shield. And that's basically it. There's so many unanswered questions like Pokemon capacity, or if Bank shares a subscription with Home. They did hint that Home will have some type of GTS capabilities, which is cool when you first think about it, until you realize Game Freak most likely removed the GTS from Sword and Shield to simply sell it back to you later on. Before we know it, we will need to pay for our Pokemon to follow us, or pay more for the verse recorder, so on and so forth. I wouldn't put it past Game Freak at this point. Which brings me to my final discussion topic, which is that people are equating Game Freak to EA due to all of their recent shady business practices. As much as I am not a fan of Game Freak, they most certainly are nothing like EA yet. Game Freak have practiced a business model for the past two decades that essentially sells consumers the exact same game three times, with marginal differences between the three. This is obviously pretty scummy, and it's getting worse. For example, you see this Pikachu? This Pikachu is locked behind a $60 USD paywall. The only way to get it is by having a Let's Go Pikachu save file on your Switch. This Pikachu was used recently to win a tournament, hence pay to win. But Smash Bros DLC characters are also pay to win. Yeah. But Gigantamax Pikachu is more than double the price of all current Smash Fighters combined, and it's just for one form of one character. Don't forget this abomination. If you want both of these in your Sword and Shield game, it will set you back 120 USD. Not quite as bad as loot boxes, but it sets an ugly precedent. There's also a Mew locked behind a $50 paywall. Let's calculate the optimal Pokemon experience in 2020. Base game, DLC, Two ugly forms of unevolved Pokemon. There's no better way to play a Pokemon game than with a Pokeball. And you must now also pay for online too. It costs almost $300 to play and enjoy everything that Sword and Shield has to offer. This is about 650% more expensive than past titles. Does the experience reciprocate that value? Hell no. Pokemon in 2020 is definitely not 650% better. It's arguably worse than it's ever been in a long time which emphasizes the terrible state Pokemon finds itself currently. Anyways, let me know what you guys think down below. With all that being said, thanks for watching you guys. Further information regarding Pokemon Home was finally released. With it, the cementing of Pokemon's grimy business model, create problems, and then sell solutions to those problems. We will come back to that. For now, let's break down everything that we learned about Pokemon Home. There will be two versions, one for the Switch and one for smartphones. This makes Home needlessly convoluted as each version has different capabilities. Home on the Switch is basically just a conduit to gain access to Pokemon residing in the Switch titles. You can't even trade Pokemon with Pokemon Home on the Switch, but you can with the smartphone version for whatever reason. This convolution is further exacerbated by the fact that Home offers two services, Basic and Premium. Basic is free of charge, which is pretty awesome until you realize how agonizingly limited it is. Premium is an expensive, paid service 
where features of past Pokemon titles are brazenly monetized in order to artificially embellish home to justify its meager existence in order to incentivize consumers to subscribe by misleading them into believing that the features they are paying for are exclusive and or new. Here is what home has to offer, the national decks. What's that little Timmy? You want to be able to have a completed living national decks in 2020? That will be $15.99 USD annually. Game Freak created a problem. They removed the national decks from the games, despite proving to be more than capable of adding back all Pokemon through patches after release. They won't do this, however, as that would hurt the bottom line. So they will, instead, sell the solution to you. They remove the national decks in order to monetize it. Home is able to store up to 6,000 Pokemon, twice that of Bank, which equates to about 1.5 megabytes worth of storage. But fear not, if you don't feel like paying for something that should be inherent to your $60 game, Basic Home gives you access to a single box free of charge. You gain access to 30 Pokemon, which only encompasses about 3% of the entirety of the National Decks. Pokemon Home allows you to finally transfer your bros to allow some of them into Galar, at a cost. You literally have to buy into a paywall in order to connect your Switch to your 3DS. Not only do you have to pay for home, you need a bank subscription as well. You need to pay for two different cloud-based services in order to transfer mere kilobytes of information. I cannot truly emphasize or express how utterly ridiculous this is. Capcom allows you to transfer information from Monster Hunter Generations on the 3DS to Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate on the Switch for free. They utilize servers, similar to Bank slash Home, to connect the two consoles together. The only difference being that Capcom does not scam you into believing that you need to store your minuscule amounts of data in the cloud. They simply use their server to transfer information from one console to the next, and then they store your tiny amounts of data on your own device, which seems reasonable. This requires one simple app that can be downloaded from the eShop free of charge. If Capcom were to exercise the Pokemon scam system, they would require not one, but two different apps and for you to pay for both apps separately in order to successfully transfer literally kilobytes of information. Again, I cannot stress enough how nonsensical this is. Even Nintendo slash Game Freak slash the Pokemon Company recognize the absurdity of their transfer scam system, so they are giving you a bank at no cost for one month's time succeeding the release of Home. After that? Too bad. Give them your money for both services, otherwise your bros are trapped forever. The GTS makes its return. The GTS was a welcomed addition back in Gen 4, and was a series staple for over a decade, until it was arbitrarily removed in Sword and Shield. Turns out it was not arbitrarily removed at all, but was strategically transferred over into Pokemon Home to assist in gouging the consumers further over something that was previously native to the series for a long time. Home has severely bastardized the GTS in order to incentivize people to restore it to its former glory. GTS is technically free with the basic home, but you only have access to 30 Pokemon. I don't think people understand how restrictive this is. The chances of you searching for a Pokemon of your choosing and having the desired Pokemon of the person you're trading will be extremely slim when you only have 3% of the national decks to work with. Therefore, trading with GTS is almost entirely useless using the basic service. Not to mention that you are further inconvenienced by being forced to use your mobile device to trade period, as the Switch version is entirely incapable of using the GTS at all. The only way to restore the GTS to its former glory is to buy it back. Game Freak created a problem, and they are now selling you the solution. They removed the GTS in order to monetize it. What adds insult to injury is that the GTS is improved upon when you buy into it. You're able to store up to three Pokemon with premium as opposed to just one, which has been the status quo in the game since the inception of the GTS. This would seem like a really beneficial addition to that $60 game you bought, but alas, that would hurt the bottom line. So instead, the feature will be removed from your game altogether, it will be added to a peripheral to help pad it out to make it more appealing, and you must now pay additional expenses in order to improve upon said feature, as opposed to the developers improving it for you in your games from one generation to the next, which is typically considered good game design that is being compromised in favor of swindling consumers. This business practice is reprehensible, encroaching into EA territory and should be lambasted by everyone. This leads me into the next Pokemon Home feature called the Wonder Box, which is literally just Wonder Trade from the games, except that it's upgraded to allow the deposit of up to three Pokemon as opposed to just one, which is available in the basic home service. Again, this would have been a beneficial addition to the mainline series, but they need to bolster home to make it as appealing as possible, so your $60 game must suffer in kind. 
This feature is further upgraded with premium by allowing up to 10 Pokemon at a time, which is 10 times better than your $60 game. They are neglecting feature progression in their games in favor of monetizing the updates instead. They included the judge function, which seems to operate exactly how it does within Sword and Shield. The catch is that the feature is locked behind a paywall in Home, which speaks volumes to how desperate they are to make Home attractive enough to consumers by tacking on superficial bells and whistles. From what was shown, they didn't even attempt to revise this feature. Instead of giving you the exact numerical value of each Pokemon's IV, they again chose to omit these values in favor of ambiguous adjectives, which are less than helpful, even more so when you take into consideration that you're now paying for this feature. They are repurposing features that are already available in order to monetize them. Temtem shows you the exact numerical IV value for every single stat, which is extremely useful when building competitive based teams. This is built directly into the status screen of the game. You don't need to talk to a random NPC in order to decipher what they tell you, and you don't need to pay for an overpriced, unnecessary cloud service either. Room Trade This is basically Wonder Trade but with extra steps, as all you can do is blind trade with others, which is exactly what Wonder Trade already accomplishes. You can join using basic homes up to 20 other people, but you cannot host your room yourself. You have to pay for such a privilege. This feature is only available on mobile. Friend Trade This has been a staple since the beginning of the franchise, being able to trade with your friends. No additional cost here, but it's only available on smartphones. Mystery Gift Another series staple. No additional cost. For some reason, the Switch version cannot receive Mystery Gifts, even though Sword and Shield have the exact same feature. It makes no sense. You get a room, which I guess is just your profile for home that can be customized. You get access to battle data, which allows you to check Sword and Shield ranked information. But this feature is only available on smartphones instead of the Switch, which is where Sword and Shield are played. Very confusing. You can also access news, but that's what the internet is for anyways. This is for smartphones only, despite it possibly containing important information pertaining to Sword and Shield. Pokemon Home has its own currency called Home Points, that can be exchanged for battle points in Sword and Shield. You accumulate points by depositing Pokemon. Not very useful for basic users that only have the ability to deposit 30 Pokemon, as opposed to 6,000. Quite the disparity. Now that we've gone through everything that Home has to offer, let's take a closer look at what Premium gives you access. Does Premium Home have anything new to warrant its steep price tag? First, let's take away all the features that are available for basic, as those features are free and do not incentivize a premium purchase. Next, let's take away all features that were either removed from past games in order to be monetized, or are currently available features that are being repurposed and monetized in order to enhance consumer appeal. This leaves us with only the room trade feature. Again, one could argue it's just wonder trade with extra steps, but I feel it's distinct enough to warrant being new. The only thing you're granted access to with regards to room trade, if you purchase premium, is that you're permitted to host a room, and that's it. Premium offers updated features that should have been included in your $60 game to begin with, but that would hurt the bottom line. But this is a business. Of course they want your money. Yeah, well, EA is also a business too, yet everyone hates them all the same, and for good reason. You can run a business without deploying scummy business practices in the hope of exploiting your consumer base. Bank is a scam, and I'm inclined to deduce that home is even worse. It's nothing more than a facade erected on deceit and greed. Let me know what you think down below. With all that being said, thanks for watching guys. I finally got a chance to sit down and play Temtem. Here are my first impressions. A uh, heads up, I will be making a lot of comparisons to Pokemon as Temtem draws several striking similarities to Pokemon that can help contrast the two. Hey guys, before we get into the video, Hal wanted me to let you know that over 80% of people that watch my videos are not subscribed. Crazy, right? If you enjoyed the video and want to be notified on future uploads, please consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out. It helps so much more than you realize and both Hal and I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks for hearing us out. Enjoy the video. I've given Game Freak a lot of flack over the past year regarding their lackluster animation, and all of it was warranted and justified. However, not all of their animations are lifeless, stilted, and expressionless. So for today's video, we will be going over the best idle animations Game Freak has to offer. 
First up is none other than Mr. Mime. Mr. Mime is, well, a mime. Bruh. A mime is an imitation artist that performs illusions. One such illusion is called the wall. It's where the mime pretends there's an invisible wall in front of them. The increased Mr. Mime idol animation elicits this idea perfectly. Pokemon Battle Revolution attempted something very similar with Mr. Mime, but the way Game Freak's Mr. Mime is animated conveys the invisible wall more clearly, with its janky motions that has it moving exclusively in one dimension, as if though he's trapped inside of a small glass box. Galarian Mr. Mime is in a similar boat, but instead of being based on a mime, as the name would suggest, this Mr. Mime took inspiration from tap dancing. The particular tap dance technique Mr. Mime's performing is called a shuffle step, which is a pretty rudimentary tap dance move. Even though both of these Pokemon have the exact same name, they are easily distinguished from both their design and animation. Mr. Grime is similar to Galarian Mime, but he uses an advanced form of the shuffle step. Grime's design is interesting, but his animation elevates him as a character even more. Hit on Top is known for spinning on its pointed top to deliver devastating kicks. Game Freak turned that upside down, literally, by portraying Hit on Top in a different light. Instead of pivoting on his pointed head, Game Freak put him on his leg. But rather than having him stand like the majority of their other Pokemon, they gave him an energetic, lively idol where Hitmontop breaks out and he dances like Yugi. This animation was most likely inspired by choreographed dance and cardio workout routines that are incorporated as breath segments in between actions to give participants a chance to catch their breath and recuperate. This translates perfectly into an idol animation for a fighting type of game. Game Freak's fun Hitmontop idol personifies him as a fitness instructor, which ties into a fighting type. While it's idling waiting for commands, it taps out to stay warmed up while recovering stamina, allowing it to be to fight at a moment's notice. Added this in post, I offered my own interpretation of Hitman Todd's idol animation, but he's actually a personification of a capoeirista, a practitioner of the Afro-Brazilian martial art of capoeira. His animation is based on a basic capoeira technique called Ginja, which Hitman on Top replicates almost perfectly. The Ginja is a simple yet fundamental movement that emphasizes both offense and defense, which is most likely what inspired Pyrogue's evolution method. Pyrogue only evolves into Hitman Top if both his attack and defense are equal at level 20. All of this is significantly cooler than my interpretation and makes it on top animation even better than it already is. I wish Game Freak employed this level of creativity and ingenuity to more of their Pokemon. Stuff like this is so interesting and makes you appreciate the craft of Pokemon creation even more. Genius sonority Roselia's idol animation always came across as graceful and elegant, which is emblematic of the rose flower that Roselia's appendages are based upon. Game Freak took note of that and felt it necessary to create a strikingly similar idol animation for their own Roselia. It's no coincidence that both animations are very similar, and Roselia is no exception, which we will see in a sec. Game Freak is most definitely cognizant of the work put in by Genius Sonority to bring the Pokemon to life, so it begs the question why they felt it necessary to strip so much personality and expression from a vast majority of Pokemon, but then leave it intact for others. I really appreciate the innovation present with him on top by applying a different concept to it, which in turn has the player perceive the Pokemon differently. Sadly, out of the near 500 animated Pokemon in Pokemon Battle Revolution, Hitmontop is the only example I know of where Game Freak implemented any semblance of creative innovation to an idle animation. Ludicolo is another example of Game Freak borrowing inspiration from Genius Sonority. The very first grass water type is exploding with personality thanks to its highly expressive and colorful animation. Think how much less interesting of a character Ludicolo would be if you had one of the typical idols that most other Pokemon are subjected to, where they're forced to stand near motions, void of any personality or unique expression. Ludicolo would leave a significantly worse impression with an animation like this. Even Ludicolo himself would be a little pissy. Spinda is yet another example of Gamefreak basing their animations off of Genius Sonority, and for good reason. Their animations do an excellent job of complementing a Pokemon's concept and design. As for Spinda, he appears to be in a kind of drunken stupor. He can be seen stumbling around, barely able to stand. This is playing off of Spinda's swirly eyes, which often signifies dizziness, a perfect blend that is seemingly trivial and quick to take for granted, but truly does go a long way into personalizing and breathing life into these characters. A simple example that I've used time and time again is Blastoise and his cannons. His cannons shoot water out of them, a trivial matter at first glance, but so much is lost from the fact that Game Freak continuously fails to respect such a fundamental, inherent character trait. Whale of Size is another good example of character identity and integrity 
lost due to lack of proper consideration and care. Spinda 2 could have fallen victim in a similar manner just as easily. Next up is Oracorio from Gen 7's Alola, more specifically the Tau form of Oracorio. This animation takes inspiration from the region itself, which is based on Hawaii. The dance it's performing is called the Hula Dance, a dance developed by the Polynesians that settled on the Hawaiian Islands. It serves as a visual portrayal of the accompanying chant or song called the Alu or Mele, respectively. Kind of like sign language, anyway. The hula dance typically complements not only Oratorio's platform design, who has plume that resembles a hula skirt and hula flower crown, but ties in the Hawaiian-based region as well in a fun and creative way. Over in Galar, we have Bear Skuda, who has an appendage that moves in a way you may not have initially expected. It reminded me of obscure character traits on other Pokemon like Rhydon's Spinning Horn, Starmie's Spinning Backstab, Explosion and Blazekin's Retractable Flames, Brayling's Extendable Arms, Bonnet's Zipper Mouth, Samurai Hiding Swords in its Arm, etc. Things that are hard or impossible to express through static sprites, but can be easily demonstrated with 3D models. I was actually pleasantly surprised during my initial playthrough when my Aracuda evolved into Barrascuda, since all I knew about Barrascuda at the time were the leaked images of it that didn't show its full animation. The propeller tail itself serves as an indicator of Barrascuda's speed, as propellers are typically associated with boats, and boats are pretty fast. Barrascuda also has a hidden ability called Propeller Tail, rightfully so, which only has a niche in doubles by ignoring opposing drawing. I ended up liking Bear Scooter even more simply because it had a cool rotating tail. Those are all of Genki's best idle animations. Which one was your favorite and why? Leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. Until next time, thanks for watching.
Welcome to another installment of the Distant Kingdom Discord server AMA. If you would like to ask me a question, make sure to leave it in the Ask Me Anything channel. Do you have any siblings? Yeah, I got three. Uh, I got two brothers and one sister. My brothers are fraternal twins, and I am the oldest out of all of them. Who's your waifu? My waifu originally was Mikasa from Attack on Titan, but she has been recently dethroned by none other than Nezuko from Demon Slayer. Nezuko is just everything. Pikachu! Pikachu! Welcome to the Distant Kingdom Discord server AMA. There's a channel where you can leave any question that you want me to answer. So if you're interested in doing that, then be sure to join the Discord. The link is in the description. All right, so the first question is, what time is it? Uh, it's currently 1.14 in the morning. I should get to bed. Older than 22? Yes. Are you a crip or a blood? Neither. How do you respond to people who are critics of your opinion? When you prove them wrong on something that you have tangible proof of. But there's new forms like Blastoise, who has acquired several brand new cannons and will use none of them. 
Was that really so hard, Game Freak? I can admit I was wrong, and I'm honestly pleasantly surprised and appreciate that they took the time to respect their characters. Game Freak finally recognized the cannon. Blastoise, for the first time ever in a Game Freak game, actually uses his cannon. This is a monumental and exciting time. Also, in a scripted cutscene, you can see the new Articuno shoot laser beams from Zai, which lines up with the promotional art we saw in the first trailer. The cutscene itself looked really cool, and I wish the game had more of them like that. And the new Slowbro also uses his cannon to attack. It's so refreshing having coherent animation. Overall, they showed some nice stuff. Some returning Pokemon have me beyond happy, like the Krugodal line, the Aegron line, the Magmar line, Luxray, and Scyther plus Caesar. The new wild areas look a lot more fleshed out and interesting than the OG wild area, which is promising. They don't appear to look as empty, and there's secrets that you can uncover like the veggies, adding more value to these areas other than being a glorified spar zone. It looks like you need to activate panels on the ground. Puzzles are a more interesting and engaging way to interact with legendaries than just walking up to them through a corridor. So I appreciate the extra effort here. There's a great variety of interesting wild Pokemon trees. It would be really cool to see a fully scaled Wailord in the wild since the overworld models are properly scaled. There's like this weird Cramorant robot thing which immediately reminded me of the Robo Groudon from Gale of Darkness. At the end of the trailer, the player character is seen partaking in a double battle against Leon and Raihan while teaming up with Hop. I wonder if this is a story extension or maybe they added a double battle mode for Pokemon League rematches? Very interesting either way. Hop, oddly enough, is not in the gym challenge attire. Perhaps you can team up with many different characters like Bead or Marnie. The official Pokemon website dives a bit deeper. In the Isle of Armour, they show a pick of a cave. It's unclear if you can actually explore this cave or if it will be an empty corridor. The pick they show looks rather uninteresting and linear, unfortunately. You can see more of this cave for a few frames in the trailer. The Isle of Armour story sounds rather uninspired. It seems like it will truly just be training in Mustard's dojo, and that's it. Crown Tundra looks like it dives into some lore and will be significantly more interesting overall, and is the expansion that introduces all of the old legendaries and the new legendaries, other than the Cubs team. Speaking of the new legendary Pokemon, let's take a closer look. First up is Reggie Lecky, or Reggie Alecky. Pretty weird name. I think Reggie Spark rolls off the turn better, but I digress. It's a pure electric type and according to his lore, is the most powerful electrotype Pokemon in existence. Quite the statement considering we have electrical monsters like Zekrom. It has some type of technology on its body for the sole purpose of controlling its power, similar to the belt used by Machoke and Machamp. It has a new electrotype called Thunder Cage, which sounds like an electrotype whirlpool. Reggie Alecki also has a new ability called Transistor, but there's no description of what it does. Maybe it increases a stat when hit with an electrotype attack? Reggie Drago, the Dragotype Reggie, was apparently crafted by our boy Reggie Big. It's really competed. I guess the completed Reggie Drago would just be another Charizard. LOL. Dragon Energy is its new attack and it works like a dragon type eruption, which can be devastatingly powerful, but not be boosted by any weather or terrain. Reggie Drago also has a new ability from Dragon Ma, but sadly there is no further detail. My guess is it boosts dragon type attacks. The new birds are indeed Galarian forms of the Pinto birds. Galarian Articuno is psychic flying type and it uses its psychic powers to levitate. Therefore, it rarely flaps its head. I mean, at least Game Freak is explaining the lack of animation. This new attack is Freezing Blair. A psychic type attack with a chance to freeze. Pretty crazy. I like the idea of combining elements into a single attack, like how Scald, a water type attack, can burn. Really cool. The Larian Zapdos is the second fighting flying type the only other being Halucha. Its signature attack is Thunderous Kick, but only seems to be electrical in name alone as it lowers defense instead of a chance to paralyze or a secondary electric titan. Galarian Moltres is a dark flying type. It uses a new attack called Fury Wrath that comes with a flinch chance. I thought its berserk ability was new, but it turns out Grandpa had it first. It grants a special attack boost when your HP is at half health or lower. Galarian Slowbro is the very first poison psychic type, with only weaknesses are ground, ghost, and dark, and it resists poison while also absorbing peace fights. Grass and fairy while taking even less from the fighting type attack. Decent defensive typing. Poison and psychic have never been too great offensively, but being able to shut down fairies and fighting type mons is valuable. This slow roll will have a tough time around steals unless it retains flamethrower. The design itself is pretty funny. The shelter lashed onto its arm, causing a chemical reaction, removing its water typing in the process, replacing the poison instead. The Larian Slowbro has a new ability in Quick Draw, alongside a new attack called Shell Sidearm, that will always hit the weakest defense. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've ever had an attack like this. I know Psyshock hits defense instead of special defense, despite being a special attack, but it doesn't flip flop depending on the system. It seems very powerful. My guess for Quick Draw is that it functions like Quick Claw, but in ability form. So Slowbro will randomly gain priority on its attack, 
which could be insane. All in all, the expansion looks really fun, and it dropped on the 17th this month. I'll be doing a full detailed review when it releases, so stay tuned for that. What do you think the new abilities do? Let me know your thoughts down below. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, guys. Despite their innumerable proficiencies, Sword and Shield, at their core, are still a Pokemon game. That enjoyable Pokemon experience is still in there, somewhere. Dynamax, however, does do its absolute best to tarnish that Pokemon experience at every turn due to its innate lack of balance. But there's still some fun to be although I do believe the game would be significantly more fun without Dynamax. With that being said, let's get into the battle. Alright, so my very first Wi-Fi battle ever. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, so I started off with, I believe, electricity. But I'm just click buttons with electricity. And the other type of man decides to lead off with Mr. Ryan. We've got that second type, so we gotta get out of there real quick. Go into the high dragon. Go into the high dragon. And we've got... Now, I actually went into Pokemon Sun and Moon version, and I wanted to make sure how new this was. And this is Rabombi taking an action, and then, like, you can pause it in the 3DS, so you can, like, look around in your, uh, Pokedex and stuff. And we can see that there's actually, like, yellow underneath the heart face on Rabombi, and that is the most that you can see inside of Pokemon Sun and Moon on the right. So the model has changed. The graphic map has changed. And also, the graphics themselves have been massively, incredibly updated. And even then, we can see, like, Rabombi is looking at a different angle as well. So, it's also kind of just gotten reworked and just looks way better. So, I just don't understand the outrage. You heard it here first, folks. Brilicify has confirmed that the models found in Sun and Moon are new, despite comparing identical models. According to Verlicify, it's an entirely new model if you can see a part of the model on one side that is completely obscured by a different animation on the other side. It doesn't matter that the models are future-proofed, having obscenely high triangle counts for a 3DS that it would literally cause noticeable frame drops, having more than two models on screen at any time, which means the models weren't made for the 3DS, but were, instead, intended to be used later on for stronger hardware like the Switch, hence the future-proof design philosophy. It doesn't matter that the models are already proven to be 100% compatible with the Nintendo Switch, with the models being ported into Pokemon Let's Go. This further fulfills the design philosophy behind the decision to future-proof the models in the first place, to be able to reuse them on more powerful hardware later down the line. It doesn't matter that Game Freak created literally thousands of unused walking and running animations to use in future titles for said future-proof models. It doesn't matter that literally all of the old, reused animations are frame-by-frame -frame identical to past games on completely different systems, which requires identical rigs or you run into glaring issues. It doesn't matter that Game Freak has been reusing the same future-proof models for over half a decade that have been in literally every single title since X and Y in 2013. It doesn't matter that the exact same models are used on completely different hardware, like phones and arcade machines, which is a testament to how flexible the models are, being able to record them into completely different systems. It doesn't matter that you can change the texture without manipulating the actual model itself in any way. It doesn't matter that all 100 plus old Pokemon from past games seen so far in Sword and Shield look the exact same as they did on entirely inferior hardware, despite it being extremely trivial to tell if a model is actually new or not. It doesn't matter that it makes negative sense for Game Freak to remake identical copies of their old assets instead of, you know, making completely brand new looking assets. It's disrespectful to Game Freak to assume they're so inept at their job that not only did they discard all of their high quality assets, they also made the new ones look exactly like the old ones instead of taking the opportunity to make better assets. None of that matters because Felicify made a grossly inaccurate and disingenuous comparison to push his deluded narrative. He somehow, conveniently, forgot that Pokemon Camp is based off of Pokemon Refresh. So instead of using Refresh for Bami for a more honest comparison, he used the Pokedex. He then recognized, immediately, that the models still look too similar for his liking, so he had Rabombi initiate an entirely different action from the one seen in Sword and Shield, to contort Rabombi as much as possible in order to deceive his clickbaited victims. The models are, therefore, confirmed, beyond a reasonable doubt, to be new due to cunning dishonesty, notwithstanding the mountains of evidence corroborating the inverse assessment, contradicting the so-called self protect confirmation that has zero substantiated evidence. Huh. It's like Game Freak 
cares about their games. It's like Game Freak cares about their audience, and the last two decades and more have only proven that, and there was no reason to doubt or attack them. Shocker. Hey guys, I hope you liked the video. Who knew comparing identical models with different proportions due to animation? Pokemon Sword and Shield isn't all bad. I've been quite critical when it comes to Sword and Shield. The reason behind this criticality is because Sword and Shield has the potential to be the best Pokemon titles in existence. Fortunately, this potential is currently being squandered for a myriad of reasons. However, the purpose of this video is to acknowledge and celebrate what Sword and Shield has accomplished up to this point. The Wild Area introduces a lot of cool new ideas that were not implemented in any other previous Game Freak Pokemon titles. The inspiration behind the Wild Area is the idea of an open world concept for Pokemon that fans of the franchise have dreamed of ever since the game was The Wild Area, however, is as its name implies, only a single area. And certain mechanics within the Wild Area, like the controllable camera, do not extend to the rest of the game outside of this area. They are confined only to the Wild Area. Sword and Shield is not an open world game, but the idea is entertained with the implementation of the Wild Area. I'm excited to see what further developments may be achieved in future generations to follow. I mentioned it briefly, but the control of the camera is a nice addition to the Pokemon franchise, even if only accessible in one area. Having properly scaled models of the Pokemon in the overworld does a great job at establishing, well, the scale of the world. The dynamic weather system of the wild area attracting certain types of Pokemon is a really nice touch. The bike having the ability to traverse water now is actually a fantastic addition. It will make exploration much more enjoyable and seamless due to not having to open up a menu whenever you want to surf on the water. Also, having the ability for your friends to join you in the open world within the wild area looks really fun. I'm also a fan of having wild Pokemon visible within the overworld as opposed to just random encounters. I like how the player character reacts to the weather environment, and you can also see the character's breath when it's cold. These two features were carried over from Sun and Moon, and I'm glad to see them in The player character designs are... Uh, okay. But there were some character designs that were really well received. These designs inspire and promote human creativity. There really is no equal when it comes to the human ingenuity inspired by wifey. A lot of the human characters have some really nice, expressive animations that exude personality. Speaking of animation, there are some examples of older Pokemon receiving updated and slash or entirely new animations. The animation Machoke used in the overworld is similar to the one found in Sun and Moon, except he has his head tilted up. When in battle, Machoke has an additional animation of his mouth opening. Machop's arms come down diagonally, he tilts his head back and opens his mouth. This animation of Weavile is completely new. Same with Fable and Dugtrio. Quagsire in Sword and Shield raises his arms into the air when it opens its mouth, as opposed to lowering its arms towards its stomach. These animations for the older Pokemon, both new and updated, are very exciting, and I hope to see many more as we near the launch of the game. Sword and Shield has some nice looking visual effects. Many people like to show these off to support their claim that Sword and Shield have high quality animations, but these visual effects have absolutely nothing to do with Pokemon model animations at all, and they don't enhance inherent Pokemon perspective. They are, however, very good at conveying the power of the attacks and seem to deliver a solid, satisfying impact in the land. There are also some physical attacks that look great, like Flame Charge and Giga Impact. The single best animation revealed by Game Freak so far for Sword and Shield is this, Score Bunny's Idolance. It is extremely expressive, energetic, and does a great job at conveying what kind of Pokemon Score Bunny is. Here are some examples of other great animations. With all new generations comes new Pokemon, and obviously I'm a fan of the newly discovered Pokemon species. I made a tier list of the new Pokemon designs and I will go through each of them very quickly. So at the very top we have Corbin. People either love it or hate it based on its edginess, but I personally think it's a really solid design overall, and it's definitely a Pokemon that I would consider putting on my own. Next up we got Roly Coley, which is an awesome name by the way. Roly Coley's concept also really complements its design. It's a clump of coal on a wheel that gets faster when hit by fire-type attacks. Genius. 
I'm really curious to see what it will evolve into. The next tier contains the bulk of Pokemon. I don't hate these designs, they're just okay. Gossifleur is just another grass type. El de Goss is okay, but I prefer Jumpluff. I like Dreadnought's design up until you reach its face. I'm not really a fan of the block head. I would prefer if the head was more animalistic, but other than that, it looks pretty good. Snapping Turtles are also really cool. Sobble, Grookey, and Scorbunny are okay. I always pick my starter based on the final evolution, and I typically go with the fire type. But we haven't had a good fire type since Gen 4 with Infernape, so we'll see. Wulu is just a sheep. And when I think of sheep Pokemon, I think of Marie. And in my opinion, Marie has a way better design than Wulu, so Wulu's just okay. Alcremi is a cream Pokemon, but that concept was already explored with Slurpuff, so it doesn't really add anything new in that department. This design overall, though, is okay. I wasn't a fan of Zacian or Zamazenta when they were first revealed, but they've grown on me a little bit. A sword doggo and a shield doggo. They're okay. I was never really a dog person, I personally prefer cats, so... Yeah. Yamper is just a corgi. Okay. Again, I'm not really a dog person, so it doesn't really pull at my heartstrings like I'm sure it does with other people. The only two designs that I'm really not a fan of are Duraldon and Impidint. There's just so much wrong with Duraldon, I don't even know really where to start. Its overall design is just really awkward. And I guess the best way to explain it is just to show what I would prefer Duraldon to be. Duraldon is supposed to be the arch nemesis of Tyranitar, but I don't really get that impression from it. As for Impidimp, I'm not a fan of the name, the noodle appendages, the Miley Cyrus tongue, or the wings on the back of its head. I am a fan of its unique dark fairy typing, so maybe its evolution will swim. As for what I'll be looking forward to, I'm always a fan of the Pokemon music, they always do a really good job at that, so I'll be looking forward to some new tracks. I also love learning of new type combinations. I personally really want a fire grass type. I thought for sure we were going to get one in the Hawaiian based region, but it wasn't meant to be. Hopefully that's not the case this generation. Anyways you guys, that about wraps up my thoughts on everything that Sword and Shield does right so far. Remember that criticism doesn't necessarily mean that a game is bad, it just means that the game needs work. So when I criticize Sword and Shield, I'm not saying that the game is bad, it just means that the source of my criticism needs a little bit more work. Also, when I criticize Sword and Shield, that doesn't mean that I hate Pokemon, Game Freak, or Sword and Shield. When I criticize Sword and Shield, it means that I want the game to be the best that they can possibly be, and I'm confident that Game Freak is both capable and competent enough to make that happen. Also, just because you praise the game doesn't necessarily mean that it would be good. Only time will tell how Pokemon Sword and Shield plays out. Thanks for watching. Maybe don't run, walk with it. Why can I even do this? Why can I do this? Why can I do this? Does this look normal to you? Does this, does this look like a good thing? Does this look like this should be happening? Me walking and my Pokemon just fucking sliding across grass and dirt? How does. What the fuck is this? What the fuck is this, man? The fuck up, Cinderace! What are you talking about over there? <laughs> Tired of this shit. <laughs> you telling me this game not trust? <laughs> oh my god!
Yo! This is what he's supposed to look like? What the fuck is that? Oh shit, the Sharpedo. This is what the... First up for today is going to be Starmie, the mysterious Pokemon. I first used Starmie as an example in one of my earlier videos to highlight the degree of degradation regarding Pokemon animation quality. Way back in Stadium 1 for the N64, over 20 years ago, Starmie's backstar could be seen spinning in its idle animation. It's simple, yet effective and highly memorable animation quirk, seeing as how I've been able to remember it after all this time amongst hundreds of other Pokemon. It's an animation entirely unique to Starmie that accentuates its already peculiar design. Most Pokemon have typical features which make them relatable. A face with a pair of eyes, ears, mouth, nose, etc. Starmie lacks all of that which can make the Pokemon hard to relate to. Many people experienced a similar disconnect concerning the Ultra Beasts. People claim they didn't feel like Pokemon. A large contributor to this is a fair number of them lacking the aforementioned features, among other things. This means that you need to be extra creative with animation to succeed in bringing the monster to life, to bypass the lack of human-esque characteristics, to craft a personality of its own that an audience can be emotionally invested in. Starmie's animation adds a level of charm that would otherwise be impossible due to the limitations present from its design. The animation idea carried over into the Game 3 Pokemon games, starting with Pokemon Crystal. It was also used during Starmie's idle animation for the Gen 5 game. However, come X and Y, this all changed. Starmie was stripped of the charm that was established through its animation in earlier titles for no discernible reason. In Sword and Shield, Starmie appeared rather lifeless. This, in conjunction with Starmie's alien-like design, has it come across as cold and distant rather than fun and energetic like Starmie of the past. Here is Starmie with its trademark spinning star story. The star only spins in one direction instead of alternating, but it gets the job done. Starmie is no longer an empty husk void of soul. Some of that lost charm has been returned, breathing new life into a character desperate for air. Next up is the lovable Sudo Ruby, the imposter tree that hates water. When the player squirted a tree-like object in gold and silver, it would do a shake and then attack. This shape, as well as the animated sprite in Crystal, is most likely the inspiration behind Sudowoodoo's animation in the older series of Pokemon. Game Freak Sudowoodoo actually has no animation at all. It stands completely stiff. And I know, I'll get a million comments down below saying, What does this do? Sudowoodoo is pretending to be a tree just like the Pokedex entry says, so of course it stands completely stiff. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. A few problems with that though. 1. The deck is referring to Wild Sudowoodoo, leading us to 2. The reason the Wild Sudowoodoo would do that in the first place is to avoid being attacked, which leads us to 3. It makes no sense for a Sudowoodoo to masquerade as a tree in the middle of a battle when that camouflage's primary function, to avoid being attacked, is entirely negated by the fact that Sudowoodoo is engaged in combat. That defeats the point of the camouflage. I appreciate the appeal to the Pokemon's lore, I really do, but it just doesn't fit given the context of the situation. Therefore, I managed to capture a familiar look. Sudowoodoo wiggles again, 
This animation references the first bit of lore we discussed, which is more appropriate and sensible for battle, with the added bonus of being a lot more interesting. Before we proceed, I'd like to take another quick look at Wingull. The change I applied to Wingull in my last video was certainly mixed. Some loved it, others not so much. I discovered a new technique that made this video possible, so I wanted to take another stab at Wingull. Wingle is still in the air, but is no longer awkwardly levitating close to the ground. Wingle is certainly more cute in its origami state, but this, I'm sure, is a satisfactory improvement for those that preferred Wingle stay in the air with its wings spread wide. I was always a fan of Maractus as it's definitely one of my favorite design Pokemon of the 5th generation. Maractus has an animation in Pokedex 3D Pro that perfectly encapsulates the fun, energetic, and lighthearted persona of the Maraca inspired cactus. Maractus's idle animation in Sword and Shield isn't bad by any means. There's some movement involved that conveys a similar personality to 3D Pro, albeit to a lesser degree. Maractus is more lukewarm and sedated in Sword and Shield, so let's turn up the heat! I feel this captures a comparable level of energy found in 3D Pro that was lost in the transition to the Game Freak 3D Pokemon games. Maractus is more lively and expressive, which really complements its colorful and eccentric design. Politoed, the frog Pokemon. Why isn't it the Toad Pokemon? Anyway, Politoed, aka Mini Kyogre, before Pelipper rained on its parade, has always had a bubbly personality. Its comfy, dynamic posture and accompanying animation solidify that aspect of it. Over time, Politoed learned how to stand, but forgot how to be expressive. Politoed in Sword and Shield, like so many others, has fallen victim to a near total lack of animation that fails to make any meaningful contribution to Politoed as a character. Let's put a spring in its step. Polytoed hops and croaks, two well-known and recognizable attributes commonly associated with real-life frogs and toads. This idol is very reminiscent of the one found in Polytoed's animated sprite from the black and white days. The following couple of Pokemon are a proof of concept rather than a fix, granting us additional perspective of the Pokemon and exploring different avenues when it comes to Pokemon expression. Raboot's idle animation is pretty average, not outstanding, but not detrimental. I, however, absolutely fell in love with Raboot when it's idle in Pokemon Camp, as it uses its fur pouch as pockets which I found to be super cool. So I wanted to apply that concept to battles. Whereas Raboot's original idol has it come across as hyperactive, this one mellows it out like it's cool, calm, and collected and has everything under control. Despite the inherent lack of animation, the dynamic posture makes up for it. That is one of the reasons why the sprites can be more expressive and are sometimes preferred compared to the 3D models. The posture of the Pokemon is typically more dynamic when it comes to the sprites, which can be just as much, if not more, expressive than an animated model. Only a select handful of Pokemon that I know of adopt a more dynamic posture over animation, which, when executed properly, can be a huge boon. Reboot, I feel, demonstrates this perfectly, foregoing more animation in favor of a dynamic pose that complements its design. Hitmontop, one of Game Freak's best idol animations, was a topic of discussion not long ago. Some people, while agreeing that the inspiration of Hitmontop's new animation was intriguing, still preferred when he was upside down. I felt compelled to entertain that idea, which led me to this. Instead of bouncing on its spike, Hitmontop spins indefinitely, akin to a Beyblade in a vacuum. It's interesting to see Hitmontop upside down again, but which do you prefer? The balance act of old or the constant spinning of new? Would you rather Hitmontop be standing on its legs or its head? Let me know your thoughts down below. That's all for now. Before I close off, 
how I wanted me to let you guys know that you can join the channel to become a member. For a single buck, you gain access to these epic Pokeball themed badges that appear next to your name whenever you leave a comment or chat during a premiere video or live stream. You also gain access to exclusive emotes and exclusive behind the scene posts. I will discuss higher tiers in a different army that accentuates its already peculiar. some more fixed Pokemon animations in A while back, I made a video addressing the disaster known as Sky Battles. If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest giving it a watch as it's one of my favorite videos I've produced and it also provides a great deal of context relevant to the video. You can either click the top right hand corner or the link in the description if you're interested. Long story short, Gameplay butchered some Pokemon. The time has finally come to undo some of that harm. Skarmory was the first I discussed in my Sky Battle video, so it seems appropriate to do the same here. In the older games, Skarmory was always grounded when in battle. Skarmory's animation gave off the territorial, savage, metal clad bird impression. A simple yet effective design choice, solidifying Skarmory as a pretty cool Pokemon all around. Then, everything changed when Game Freak attacked. They dropped Pokemon X and Y back in 2013 and introduced a one off gimmick called Sky Battles where you challenged NPCs in a skybox. In order to produce the illusion that Pokemon were in the 